So this video is all about the top retro QRP stations of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. What do I mean by retro QRP? Now remember, QRP existed as a kind of operating abbreviation in the handbook. And when you look it up, it says, shall I decrease power? And then when you send QRP, uh, yes, decrease power, please. You're overwhelming my receiver. You're overwhelming the whole net. You need to decrease power right now. Okay, that's what QRP is all about. You need to decrease power. It never really meant operating at low power on purpose. Who would want to operate at low power on purpose? That doesn't make any sense. We're trying to get our messages through with ham radio. Why would we want to use very low power? Let me tell you, there was a QRP controversy that occurred in the late 60s and early 70s talking about just what power level represents QRP. And at first, anything under 100 watts was considered QRP because remember, in the 60s, we were trying to get as much power out as possible. Who in their right mind would want to run lower power? But finally, in the 1970s, uh, the definition generally means that we're operating below the 5 watt level. So let's investigate those stations, some homebrew, some commercial, uh, some something in between, uh, that people put together to operate QRP in the very early days. So we're going to go through 10 different examples of QRP rigs. I hope you enjoy this video on the foundations of QRP operation. Okay, folks have been begging for this video for a while. This is the QRP stations, the commercial offerings especially of the 1970s and 80s. Really the birthing of QRP as we know it today. Is life too short for QRP? I don't know. I think that there's a lot of room on the band for QRP operation, and the band is only utilized as a small percentage of time uh, in between contests, and I think uh, QRP operation has taken off since we've had the various clubs and uh, different types of numbers that you can collect in the QRP world. This is, this is really exciting. Um, QRP has become a whole facet of a ham radio on its own. This is a little 100 milliwatt. Three two nine with a hundred milliwatts. And uh, you kind of have to start with uh, the homebrew idea. And then as the manufacturers decided, hey, maybe this is a thing, you start to see commercial QRP rigs arrive on the scene. So I'll start with uh, a discussion of some of the homebrew projects. Uh, the ARRL handbook begins to show QRP projects for the first time in the early 70s. So, uh, of course, ham magazines in the 50s and 60s 
always featured QRP 1 and 2 transistor type circuits, starting with uh, PNP transistors back in the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, people were building QRP rips. So I'm definitely showing some classics here. Um, of course, we've got the, uh, the 10 Tech, uh, Mighty Mo, Mighty Might, or whatever you want to call it. It's kind of an interesting little rig that we'll go through. Well, let's see if we can get this guy on our little power mite transceiver. I guess the power might still has some magic left in it. The Heath kit, the HW7, HW8, and so on. This is a whole game changer here with the Heath kit. So you're looking at the Tentec Power Mite. This is a really cute rig. It's made for the serious DX QRP operator who's only really interested in 40 meters and 20 meters. So it's a little two-bander. Isn't that cute? Here's the famous Argonaut, the 509, and this became a whole series in the 1970s and it was popular all through the 80s. This brought QRP uh, beyond CW into the world of single sideband. Now the uh, HW7, of course, is the one that everybody is going to remember because this was a super popular rig. Heathkit really hit a home run with QRP and the HW7, HW8 series. My first QRP that I did, of course, was a single transistor, usually a 2222, something like that, putting out maybe 50 milliwatts. A single transistor oscillator. And if you look at these parts here that I have on the table, this is really all that was required in the early 70s to get on the air with QRP. You needed a transistor, and some people used a 2N2222, other people used a, some other type of RF transistor they might have gotten their hands on. This is a nice transistor here that uh, is in a larger TO39 package. You needed some type of capacitor and coil to make the resonant circuit of the oscillator. You needed a nice crystal. This one's in the 40 meter band. This is 7110. This would still work today. And then a few biasing parts and bypassing parts. And you stick this on a prototype board and there's your QRP rig. It might put out 50 to 50 milliwatts to perhaps 2 watts with something like this. And on 40 meters, you'd ex be expected to make contacts all up and down the East Coast with a good dipole. So we have to remember, this is how many people started with QRP. A simple one transistor oscillator transmitter. But I later graduated to two transistor designs using crystals and made my own transceiver. This is a transmitter receiver. It's a single conversion superheterodyne 
with a two transistor crystal control transmitter with multiple crystals. So I can switch frequencies quickly here to the different crystals that are inside. A lot of fun using this radio. I even used a QRP in the mountains of Montana and it worked just fine. And that was back in the, uh, the early 80s. I think I dragged this thing to Montana and used it much like W7ZOI would have. Yes, this is in fact a 2N2222 transistor, as you can see. It puts out about 100 milliwatts with about 13 volts on the collector. And it's working with a 7046 kilohertz crystal in the 40 meter band. That's how we made the contact. So you might be wondering why I didn't mention uh, single sideband um, and double sideband. Certainly there was a QRP um, contingent, I guess you'd say, that uh, got into single sideband and double sideband and even AM QRP operation. Uh, solid state design for the radio amateur has some of these early double sideband and single sideband rigs and these were written up both with uh, two band transistor circuits in a lot of the magazines. So let's transition into the top 10. We're going to be talking about the top 10 QRP rigs in the early days. Let's get started. So yes, I'm making some broad generalizations and uh, maybe oversimplifying things, but QRP is mostly CW and QRPP, less than five watts, is still the simple way to beat the miles per watt game without resorting to digital means. That is, I'm limiting the discussion to early equipment and not modern gear, kits, SDR radios. The, there's a whole explosion of uh, QRP today. I'm talking about those very early days. So let's start with number 10. It's really an homage to the classics. It's the Amico AC1. Who guessed this would be actually on our list? Maybe Grandpa was going for Q QRP power? No, I don't think so. Actually, I think Grandpa was going for a low parts count and especially a low price. Nevertheless, the AC-1 and all of its single-tube slatboard cousins and single-tube uh, transmitters. As far as low power operation goes, these define number 10. Let's look at the schematic. Hey, see how simple that is? Build it, it works. Number 9. Number 9 is where somebody actually brags about being low power. Hey, I'm lower power than you are. And that somebody was old buzzard George. Yes, I'm talking about W1GAC, a real AM QRP legend of a man. And in QST, December 1951, George published The Mighty Mo, a complete miniature AM station. This will be modified into the wild proliferation of mobile transmitters in the 50s. So mobile Mobile operation in the 50s is really where QRP started with voice communications. Number eight. Number eight is the first attempt at QRP in a commercial radio. It's the 10 Tech Century 21. What do you, well, hold it, the Century 21? I thought the Century 21 was 70 watts. Well, my friend, 70 watts was QRP in the 1960s. This was a complete solid state radio dedicated to the CW operator alone and it was a big hit. This would keep 10 Tech in the CW game long enough to think of more serious QRP rigs. Note the modular nature of the build. This, this particular style of building, where you have a module and then you integrate the modules, testing each module individually before integrating them, this will carry over into the reference design boards of today from places like Analog Devices and Texas Instruments. But this was pioneered by companies like International Crystal. You remember their single board modules? So making uh, QRP rigs with individual modules and then integrating later, it allows improvements. And it's much easier with homebrew uh, construction. Number seven is the Mountaineer by none other than Wes Hayward, W7ZY, and Terry White, K7TAU. It was published in August 72 QST and was a direct result of a new trend in QRP operation. That is hiking and camping with portable gear. Gear small enough to be stuffed in a backpack with a battery pack and taken to some remote mountaintop 
uh, for some added ham radio fun and adventure. The Mountaineers receive section was a single-ended dual-gate MOSFET mixer acting as a direct conversion receiver. As you might know, this was the basic design used in the Heath HW7 and some of the early uh, QRP rigs of the day. The dual-gate MOSFET was a very popular part back in the 60s and late 70s. Some of you know that this arrangement is very sensitive, but it also suffers a bit from hum pickup, microphonics, broadcast band interference, breakthrough, things like that. West quickly redesigned the unit and came up with the Micro Mountaineer. This approach gave us the added protection of a single balance mixer style of DC reception. DC, what's that? That's direct conversion. Direct conversion is where the VFO basically is on the same frequency as the signal you're trying to receive. Well, they're offset a little bit. W7EL Roy Luallen took this further with a fully balanced direct conversion receiver using a diode ring mixer in its high dynamic range optimized design. Speaking of legends, number six is the classic Doug DeMaw Tuna Tin 2 that appeared in the 1976 issue of QST. This later transitioned into a plethora of kits and articles that live on seemingly forever. The Tuna Tin is a two transistor transmitter with TR switching on board, all in a small round package that you can roll around the ham shack. Speaking of legends, let's pray because we're going into radio religion with number five. It's the PW7 by the Reverend G.C. Dobbs, G3RJV, published in Practical Wireless Magazine, May 1983. A complete transceiver included as a single balance direct conversion receiver and a multi-stage transmitter with proper changeover and side tone. Dobbs would found the GQRP club and he was a giant in the UK early QRP scene. At number four, we have Tentec showing up with finally a dedicated low power QRP platform. It's called the PowerMite. The PowerMite series was the first rig that Tentec offered in uh, 68 through 71. And it was simply made with little modules that were all connected together. The first unit is an 80, 40, and 15 meter job targeting the novice crowd. But the PM3, by the time they get that far, it's really looking for the QRP DXer on 40 and 20 meters. That's what I used to make a, a few contacts this week. These are all direct conversion receivers with simple VFO. The VFOs doubled for 20 meters on the PM3. It's interesting, so it tunes twice as fast. It suffers from bad broadcast band interference, and I actually added a trap at the input, but it is a clever little rig, and I love the side tone. Speaking of side tone, number three, the Heath HW7, HW8 family. Uh, the HW7 was the first QRP transceiver offered by Heathkit. It was available from 1972 through 1975. The HW7 provided a coverage of 40, 20, and 15 meter bands, making it very tempting as a low-cost novice rig. So one way that QRP got started was by tempting novices to buy these low-cost radios as their first radio. Guess what? QRP operators are suddenly born. The transceiver featured a very simple direct conversion receiver design, similar to the ZOI design with the dual gate MOSFET. And, and this simple design led to the same performance problems, including sometimes severe broadcast interference, microphonics, and AC hum. According to the January ARRL review, January 1973 that is, the original price of an HW7 was around $70. The HW8 was the second QRP offered by Keith Kitt. It replaced the HW7, and it was offered uh, between 76 and 83. Now, it looks similar, and it's very sa same size as the HW7. The 8 uh, featured a much more sophisticated direct conversion receiver design. Uh, here you're looking at the wonderful Motorola 1496. Uh, you've got some fantastic front-end pre-selection here. You've got a real active filter at the output. This is really a far superior radio to the HW7. But don't let it fool you. Even an HW7 is a fantastic radio. 
Okay, number two, Tentec comes around again with the Argonaut. Now the Argonaut's a little bit higher power. The Argonaut's a well-designed but bare-bones CW single sideband rig, and it is a single conversion super heterodyne. The small size, a uh, fifth of a cubic foot, makes it ideal for portable operation. And this really caused a cult following. To be able to take your rig in the car, camping with you to the camp, and just using it off the car battery or off a small power pack, it really was a, a wonderful radio. When the 509 came around, like that 509 I was playing with, um, it really uh, was pretty sophisticated. And uh, I think whether you choose single sideband or CW, uh, this thing's going to give you 3.5 all the way to 30 megahertz. It is a cute little transceiver. So number one, we're finally at number one, guys. Number one, of course, is the Japanese Yesu Musen FT7 solid state 80 through 10 meter transceiver for fixed and mobile uh, CW and sideband. Uh, it's a 50 watt radio and uh, AM about 12 watts. It's a single conversion receiver. It has good sensitivity and selectivity, a CW audio filter, and the VFO is the standard 5 to 5.5 megahertz. So the receiver covers the 80 meter band directly. Um, introduction around 1979 and uh, the Japanese market for low power transceivers it was much bigger than the US market they've got a small island they had some power restrictions uh, low power really takes off in Japan and in the UK and uh, their markets favored that kind of operation there are many other examples of Japanese manufactured uh, QRP transceivers that come out of that era in the 70s and early 80s but they're very, very rare in the U.S. and Europe. So uh, another thing of note with the uh, with the Yesu, the radio uses plug-in modules for all its subsystems. So as uh, with the rest of the ham radio equipment at the time going towards Japan, these radios easily outclassed the lower-cost U.S. offerings like the Argonaut. So did some of you enjoy that little trip down memory lane talking about all those old QRP rigs? Hey, this is a giant subject and one that uh, I kind of took a broad brush against. First generation QRP and uh, of course today it's exploded into a whole uh, hundreds of websites just on QRP alone, clubs galore, uh, radio sport, QRP contests, um, kits, uh, single board QRP um, projects, magazines full of this stuff today. But uh, it was nice to look at the history of uh, where QRP got started. Um, you're going to find uh, websites devoted to bringing some of those old transceivers that we talked about up to snuff. and. Uh, you know, fixing all of those microphonic problems and putting in new direct conversion circuits to overcome the, uh, the weaknesses, uh, filtering, and so on. But these are the granddaddies of all those SDR modules you're working with now. Hope you enjoyed this video on uh, kind of the birthing of QRP.